Welcome to Digging Deeper, Make Creativity Your Business Advantage. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Today on the program, buckle up, everyone. The Mitch Joel is here. You may know him from his best-selling books, Six Pixels of Separation and Control-Alt-Delete, his blog and podcast, Six Pixels of Separation, or from the dozens of keynotes or media appearances where people want to know the future of technology, digital, and how it affects the media marketing and beyond. He is a futurist. He's a visionary. And frankly, it's really freaking cool to have him on the show. So we're going to have Mitch Joel here today. We're going to talk to him about what is new uh, what is emerging and beyond. This will be the first time uh, I have asked anyone about Clubhouse on the show. Uh, and I also want to dig into some other topics as well. So we're going to have fun uh, with Mitch. So stay tuned for that in just a moment. Also, as promised last week, I want to report back on my test with Amazon Live. I did a little kick the tires thing on Friday, which was interesting and fun. I won't say that it was enormously successful, but it was easy. So it was successful. Um, I think I had seven people watching. So the, the key is to build, the, build an audience over there. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the show. Then I have a reminder of the big live show later today to celebrate the launch day. The book is here. Today is February 23rd, officially the day the publisher tells people they can sell it, I guess. I don't know, because Amazon sent it two weeks ago, so I don't know how that works. But today was the official date that we circled on the calendar for this is when the book is coming out. And that means I think Barnes & Noble and all those other places where you might go and buy a book uh, other than the internet uh, have the thing available for you. So uh, there's a big show coming up later on today. I'm doing an 1130 live ridiculousnesses with David Meerman Scott and Eric Deckers and Christy Samus and my, my buddy, comedian buddy Josh Need is going to come in and, and tell jokes about influencers and uh, all capped off by my mom. So that'll be fun. And that's coming up later on today. Uh, all of uh, that and more coming up on Digging Deeper. Now, this is normally the uh, the point in the show where I say uh, something like, uh, this podcast is made possible by whatever, or whatever. But uh, for the next couple of weeks, the support for the show is provided by Winfluence the book. Uh, Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand is available now from Entrepreneur Press. You can find it now, as of today, in bookstores everywhere. Uh, but I'll, I'll have a special place for you to go online. There, it's on your screen now if you're watching live. Uh, but I'll tell you more about it if you're listening on the audio version of this or a recorded version of this uh, in just a second. So you can go and get a discount. So stay tuned for that. So Winfluence the book is not just a strategic blueprint to help you employ smart influence marketing strategies for your business or clients, but it explains why our common perception of influencer marketing is all wrong. I take you through how to rethink and reframe the concepts to turn influencer marketing into influence marketing, broaden the perspective and open new avenues of leveraging influential people online and offline to grow your business. The special URL and discount code just for the Digging Deeper audience is jason.online slash buy winfluence. That's jason.online slash buy winfluence. That takes you to the book at entrepreneurpress.com's store online. And then use the code FALLS20, all caps, FALLS20, F-A-L-L-S-2-0, and you'll get 20% off the retail price. That address, again, is jason.online slash buy Winfluence. After you read the book, uh, leave a review on Amazon because select reviews will be read here on the show. Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand is finally available now. Jason.online slash buy Winfluence. Use that code falls two zero falls 20 for that. If you are dialing into the LinkedIn uh, broadcast, the Facebook broadcast, YouTube or Twitter broadcasts, you can jump in the comments section there or hit at reply on Twitter to the video and ask questions and interact with us here on the show. Jump in the comments and say hello and ask your question. I'm already seeing some people in there. Oh my goodness. We've got a, ni a nice uh, audience for Mitch this morning. Izzy House is here again. Good morning, Izzy. Good to see you. I know there was a snag with Cornette's LinkedIn last week, so didn't see you last week, but uh, uh, I understand you watched the recording, so welcome. Chip Griffin is here. Uh, he he says, Mitch, exclamation point, and then says that I should join uh, Mitch and him in shaving your head. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to do that. Uh, Mitch and I were talking earlier. I'll show you in a minute. And I got a little, little joke for you on that one. Um, and then uh, Ann Lebinsky says, hello, Ann, good to see you. And uh, Chris Brogan stopped by to say, just wishing you a great launch day, buddy. So thank you for that 
uh, Chris. So, so got some people here in the comment section uh, dialing in, and I'm glad you're here. Please jump in and ask questions uh, of me or Mitch during the show. All right. Without further ado, uh, let me let me let me lay this joke on everybody. That that over no that over there is uh, Chia Pet before, <laughs> and this is Chia Pet after. Good morning, right. Mitch Joel. How are you? Good morning. I don't mind being the before if I have to. I just want to, like, what do you think is better before or after? I wonder. In life, I'm, in general. <laughs> I'm sure the before picture in this is what people would probably, you know, defer to. Um, but, you know. Typically, we like the after one, though, Jason. I don't know, man. There's a lot more bourbon in this one. So <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. Probably a sure. public health hazard. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, Todd Lanham jumping in saying happy Tuesday and, uh, and Chip Griffin is now singing the song. Ch -ch 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 so there you go. Uh, Chris, well, Brown, congratulations Hi, on your book launch, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. I was, I was tickled that you were going to be on the show today, uh, because you, uh, and, and folks like David Meerman Scott, who wrote the forward to the book, um, are kind of my professional mentors in the space. And so to be able to kind of share this and celebrate with you on this day is kind of nice. So thanks for coming. And your mom. I mean, I, how do I compete with your mom? This is ridiculous. Like, I mean, can you give me a tougher act to open for? Uh, probably not. Mom's pretty impressive. Yeah. Now, you, keep in mind, uh, she she now mom is a communications professional, too. So she, it's not that she's just coming back because she's my mom. But uh, she hurt. spoke at a conference I did one one time and she works for the transportation cabinet in Kentucky. So she does the road closures and, and bridge namings and things like that. Construction stuff. And she she presented me with a gift uh, before she gave her talk at a conference I hosted several years ago. And the gift was uh, a throwaway box of home breathalyzer kits. <laughs> so okay. I was like, what? So that was Mom amazing. loves her children. Yes. And and her her spot on the little live show this afternoon will be interesting and I'm sure embarrassing, but that'd be fun. <laughs> so uh, Mr. Joel, uh, the, the talk of the social world right now is Clubhouse and social audio. I know you recorded an episode of your podcast there with Jeremiah Alyang, who is all about Clubhouse right now. Is this something really worth our time? I mean, I'm an audiophile, and I don't necessarily care for it. But I also, uh, in its own defense, have not spent a great deal of time there. So what do we need to know about Clubhouse? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, one is I, I, I'm, I'm trying not as I get old uh to not be dismissive of a new platform because i haven't tried it <laughs> like just not to throw one at you real not to throw a haymaker at you out of the gates here but we can't be dismissive of things until we see what it is and see what the value is and so right now we're in a situation where this thing came out um they're calling it social audio and if you think about the progression of digital audio it started back in podcasting which you know i've been running one of the longest business podcasts in the world since 2000 and six, I think, nonstop. So I think it is the actual longest running business podcast in the world. We then move very quickly-ish into the world of voice assistant technology. So think about things like your smart speakers and your world like that. And then the emergence of what we're calling social audio actually didn't really happen with Clubhouse. I'd argue that it happened a few years ago with Discord. Uh, yep. Discord really is this place where, you know, for those of us old to remember, it's the party line. You have one centralized place where everybody can talk at the same time. And the application of it is very logical. If you're playing a video game, for example, you could have a Discord server. So now you're not connecting over a live subscription service, but it's essentially a free service. And not only can the people who are gaming call in, but anybody can call in. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a massive comic book nerd and that it's been popular in that realm too. Somebody will do a live show like this and then open a Discord server so everybody can actually talk and connect. It has a lot of functionality. It's got a valuation of $10 billion plus dollars. Clubhouse comes along and you know the world perks up its ears, liter literally. Um, and what's happening here is very similar to that. It's a place where I could build a clubhouse, a room, mm -hmm. and everybody can come in and it's audio only. Mm -hmm. Now, is it a, a, a factor, a function of these pandemic times we're in? Yeah. Is it a function of a need with an audio? I think it is. Because if you think about things like my podcast, your podcast, whatever we're talking about, it's pre-recorded, edited, and published. Yep. Now we're really entering this ability to have live audio. So when people say, you know, I don't really know if it's for me, 
one is you have to be interested in live audio and it is right. live. So for me, it's been really interesting. I've been in there quite a bit. I've started rooms. I booked rooms. As you said, I had Jeremiah Aoyang on. Um, I'm doing it again today with Kat Cole. So I'm super excited about that. We're going to be recording that live today in Clubhouse at 1 p.m. Eastern. And I like it because <clears throat> I do live radio. Uh, every yeah. Monday I do three hits for different stations and it goes out across the interwebs and all that. But it's a crazy experience, as I'm sure you can appreciate, because I don't practice all week. <laughs> so you, you're kind of like hot on the mic live for seven or eight minutes for a segment. And I have no in between to really get my reps in. Right. So for me, it's been an incredible place, uh, one, to build reps. Two is to learn about it new. And because you're not just speaking, you're moderating. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a whole other skill set. And so, as I like to say, listen is easy, talk hard, right? Like talking is hard. Doing your show, doing what you do now, being on video is hard. People don't recognize that it's not just that pretty bearded face that's coming <laughs> to you live and hot. There are lights, there's video software, there's restreaming software, there's mixing boards. You are like the person on stage. At the same time, you're also the AV team at the front and back of house. Yep. So audio you know, is, is more forgiving, right? Like I don't have to shave or put on makeup to get <laughs> on. I don't have to worry about my lights and how do I look and do I look pale and pasty, which I always do. Um, and I also love audio. Yeah. So the ability to follow interesting people, the ability to be joining rooms in very niche and specific topics, mm -hmm. the ability to have real public discourse over some of the issues of the day, I found it to be really interesting. At the same time, I really hate it and I think it could be a massive cancer. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is because there are people who have accumulated a massive following, yeah. like millions of followers already. So you got a platform that, you know, yesterday had 6 million, today it's got 10 million. Also, you should know it's iOS only. So there's no Android support and there's no desktop support. It's yeah. invite only, so it's not open. Um, so we got about 10 million people on there. You got people with a million and a half, two million followers. Do the math on that. What does that mean? You have rooms that are limited to 5,000 people capacity. Now it's, they move it up to sometimes six or 8,000. Mm -hmm. So do the math on that. Like if you have a room of 6,000 people and everybody follows you, how long does it take you to get to a million? Yeah. So there's this preferential list thing happening that's very hard to understand. Mm -hmm. It feels a little Silicon Valley entertainment, hoi polloi VC based. Um, and the problem is when I click on your profile, Jason Falls, the only thing I see is your follower count. Yes, yeah. there's a bio for sure. There's a bio, but we all know what people do with their bios. Yeah. And so th the challenge is pretty dramatic because I'm not seeing, it's not like Twitter where you go on and you're like, well, Jason Falls has a million followers, but you can see his tweets. I can see how often you tweet. I can see the quality of them. I could see how many people like retweet, share. It actually gives me a perspective into what the future of your influence might be as well. Right on Clubhouse, I just I, it boggles my mind that we're here in 2021 and mm -hmm. somebody launched a brand new social media digitally based platform. And the only metric we can have for any sort of knowledge of anybody is followers. So you can have a million followers and never open a room, and still everybody's following you. It's yeah. like a bizarre. So I they need there's a lot of work to be done in terms of metrics and qualifications, but the overall idea, if you're into audio, it's awesome. It's fun to do. Yeah, I've, I've been in there a couple of times and I've only been in one or two rooms that I stuck around for more than about 15 seconds. Yeah. And and they were both rooms where the moderator was someone I knew um, and it was a very informal conversation. It wasn't anyone trying to, you know, on stage trying to, you know, conduct a show, a, a yeah. podcast or a, a talk. Um, which is kind of what it seems to have evolved to. Sure. And the thing that struck me or has stricken me in several rooms is you basic it's there's nothing really social about it. You have two or three people talking and everybody else listening. And I don't find that to be social. It's like a an audio version of a conference talk well, um, I th where you don't get a lot of Q&A. Yeah. And in fairness, the platform, it's new. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things I'll often do is I'll make my morning coffee, which I haven't done yet. I'll fire up a room that's only accessible to my social graph. So it's not open to the public. Mm -hmm. And I always say this room will last as long as the coffee lasts. Yep. And then all the mics are off. Everyone is on that, what they call the stage, which I hate the fact that it's called the stage. Um, but I think for someone like you or someone in communications, the win in Clubhouse is not to sit in the audience. 
-hmm. I think the win is to try to build some kind of platform right. and or express some, some form of domain of authority. Right. So if you're not making a room, if you're not modding a room, like being a moderator room or contributing to a room, I can see it being tiresome because the truth is, I mean, how full is your, is your podcast catcher right now with great quality content that you've curated or my saved videos on YouTube. So I don't think it wins at that. I think it does when it's serendipity. I think it can be social, but there are different types of rooms too. So there are rooms right. you'll go in where you feel like you're a fly on the wall. There's rooms you go in where it's all open and it's hang out. There's, it really depends on what you're looking at. So again, you know, you got to think of it as being Twitter before the at and hashtag. It's kind of where it is. Yep. That's it'll fair. evolve. It'll evolve. It, it will. Uh, Chip, Chip Griffin says uh, he drinks espresso. So his room wouldn't last long. That's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to steer clear of additional jokes on that one, Chip. Uh, Bob Farnham says someone get Mitch a coffee. Um, uh, a really good question here from, um, from Shane Chaps, uh, who runs a, a social media agency here in Louisville. Um, what about Twitter spaces? You know, there, your clubhouse, yeah. uh, Facebook, there's a bunch of, or Twitter, uh, Facebook, there's a bunch of people already kind of rushing to replicate what clubhouse has. What's that going to mean for this whole social audio world? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, let's talk a little bit of business on this. So Andreessen Horowitz put in another hundred million. I think there was already a preliminary round put in valuing the company at over a billion dollars. At the same time, Twitter has Twitter spaces. And what I mean by has is I've been in there. I've seen those rooms. Jeremiah L. Yang has Twitter spaces that he opens up. It is very, very familiar. I would argue it has more functionality. I would think that anybody trying to build a new platform, like it's a kind of a land grab. You're talking about Winfluence and influencer marketing. You know what this is. People have been waiting. Like, when's the next TikTok? I'm not missing out. Mm -hmm. And so right now, everyone's you know grabbing up the land. I think it's going to be harder to do if Twitter has a comparable and it does look very, very comparable. And I would argue even better from, from a functionality. What am I going to be doing growing a, a platform in there if I'm already verified or have a level of following in Twitter? Mm -hmm. You're right. Facebook has announced that they're coming into the space. Uh, there's been also Mark Cuban and another co-founder talking about a platform that they're opening up that has a lot of similar features. So again, I think Jeremiah Al Yang and the people who are talking about this social audio idea are onto something. There is not going to be one place to go. Uh, and it's going to be very, very challenged to figure out how it scales. And I see that, you know, you can really tell by what's happening in Clubhouse that they were taken aback by the mass level of popularity. And now they have to validate a billion dollar valuation, which makes the business aspect of it really, really challenging. So any surprises in any of that? Like, no. I mean, as soon as TikTok had any resemblance of anything, everybody had all those features everywhere. And we could even go back further in time and argue that, you know, what was Twitter? Twitter was essentially the isolation of the status update of Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, cranked down to at the time 140 characters. And there were many people, maybe you included, definitely me, who said, what's the point of Twitter when I can just write a status update on Facebook and I already have a community there? So again... Yeah. It's the evolution of it, and we're going to see. Am I surprised that there's competitors in the space? Clearly not. And I do think that it could become an additive function versus a destination. So yeah. I can see this happening uh, much in the same way as we've seen in other applications. Like it might be the Slack for B2B. It might be an integration <laughs> of audio. So it's not just sending messages, but we could talk to one another, have rooms like that. I also question what this is going to look like usage wise when the world does open up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I'm not of the belief that we will stay fully remote. Yeah. I think that we, we miss office spaces. I think we miss meetings. I think young people and middle management people do not realize what this does to their professional development in terms of if you want to have a raise, if you want to move forward, if you want to change jobs, if you want a different job title, uh, this Zoom stuff is very stifling to your professional development long term. It may yeah. not be in your day to day activities, but if you're looking to evolve, it's really problematic. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I will. I don't miss meetings. Um, I, I don't. I don't necessarily want to go back to those. But um, but I do agree that there that face to face and that in person in office thing is going to have great value. But I think also too, good managers 
are going to shift the way they assess employees and, and the way they handle professional development. So I think there will be some companies that adjust and are like, virtual is fine, but we need to account for these things because they're going to be different. You can account for it, but you can't account for serendipity. So let me give you one example that I feel is the example that I feel is literally what actually happens. Okay. So you're right. There's check boxes and this person's ready to go from this role to management to this. You're right. And that exists and we can do that. But what we can't do is have a situation where I was running my agency with my business partners. We're sitting, having a meeting and talking about a client issue and somebody walks by and that person who walked by the other day was telling me something about something that actually was relevant to this. And I'm like, why don't we put Mira on it? She mm -hmm. had this idea while we were having coffee yesterday. I never put two and two together, but she mentioned that is probably 100% of what gets really interesting people on interesting projects that get really, really meaty. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we replicate that. I don't know how we replicate real culture development within the organization. And I also really don't know, and I include meetings in this, uh, how we truly find real innovation if we're all kind of just working in our socks at home. I just yeah. don't know that I can see and feel that. There are certain people who are solopreneurs. There are certain people who are more freelance-based. There are certain people who are more you know, half-time CMOs types of things. Fantastic. That's a whole other market. But there's a vast majority of young people coming into this market. There's a vast majority of people in their 30s or 40s who are trying to move forward. I don't see how this plays out from Zoom. I, I just don't. And maybe I'm wrong. And I, I'm, I'm fine if I'm wrong, by the way. I'm wrong all the time. <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't I don't necessarily think you're wrong. There's a lot to account for there. And I, I do hope that we all get back to some sense of of the way it was. Although I do love the fact that so many business owners are realizing that they can trust their employees and we can be virtual and we can survive this way and, yeah. and actually thrive. I mean, for Cornette, I think across the board, all of us at Cornette would agree that we're probably more productive uh, in this virtual world than we were before just because we don't have commute time. Some of us are working a little extra hours because we don't have that commute time. Um, we, I think, are much more intentional um, in with our intensity level and our focus because we know we have to be right. in order to overcome those those challenges. Yeah, I mean, the other side of it is just the business development, the relationships, the how you really push it forward. So I think that to say that is fair, and I think productivity is one metric. Some people are arguing that productivity is actually in the toilet, but that's you know, maybe more of an extreme of where I am. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's going to take all kinds and I don't know what we're going to see from the biz dev side. What I'm seeing is, is what I call this idea of the great compression. The fact that everything that people like you and I have been talking about for close to two decades really happened in a much shorter window of time. And, you know, the, the, the standard example is if you look at, you know, e-commerce was what, 15% of overall commerce spend, it went up to 50 plus percent. It's going to drop. It's not going to go back to 15, but we've digitized. I mean, we've digitized everybody from our kids in K1 up to the people, up to our oldest of elderly uh, in, in the elder care facilities. So there's no doubt that we've changed consumer behavior and the speed of that happened in this much more compressed moment of time, which to me is, is all good news. It's all good news because this is what we've been talking about. Brandon Arve just jumped in on Facebook with an interesting comment here that's I think relevant to this. He says, I think for the same reason people thought Best Buy was going to die because of Amazon, virtual and in real life experiences will find a good way to live together. They will find their purpose. I definitely agree. agree with that, Brandon. Yeah, I agree. In fact, when, we when, when I talk up to my fellow speakers about this and they're really worried about you know what's going to happen, I'm like, look, there's three scenarios. Scenario one is the CFO goes, look, we had a great run with this virtual. We have more people sign up. We've got this content we can use forever. It's cheaper. It makes more sense. We had three times the signups, et cetera. Number two is, look, it, it, it was August, September of last year. We were back to school. We realized we're in this for the long haul. We went from survival to sustain. And we were starting to think, how do we engage our customers and how do we engage our employees? And the answer is, well, as things open up, we'll do smaller, more regional based little things. And then number three is the world that I occupy, which was 60 to 70 times a year, flying like a maniac all over the world and speaking <laughs> at these massive conferences. And the answer isn't which one. The answer is all three. 
Yeah. And so if you are a professional speaker or someone who's in communications, I look at that and go, wow, we've just maybe unlocked two to three new types of business ways that I can communicate and I can get my message to spread further and wider. And it's more interesting. So I'm fine doing this on virtual. I'm happy to meet up uh, in a smaller local community-based event. And I'm happy to get on a stage with you know a couple thousand people or a couple hundred people in, in a room. So that's where I think Brandon and others are right. They talk about this idea of which one will it be? And I think it's going to be in everything. Yeah. And that's really opportunistic if you're in this space and you're smart. Yeah, very true. Uh, really quickly, I, I have a question about uh, one more question about Clubhouse and then Eric uh, uh, Carico, I believe, or Carico jumped in with one as well. I wanted to ask you very specifically, will Clubhouse change podcasting? Are we going to see a shift there to basically live only live streaming has certainly started to change online video hasn't killed it. You know, the recorded video is still there, but is it going to shift podcasting to more of a live stream type of thing? No, I, I don't think so. Um, and the analogy that I use, and I know you're a fan of music like I am is the analogy is, so are we going to stop recording albums because we're playing live? <laughs> And that's the okay. analogy. It's like there's a, there's a place for th well thought out, curated, produced content, and there's a place for live content. Yeah. Will the share of ear, as our buddy Tom Webster from Edison Research likes to say, <laughs> shift to people more interested in live? Perhaps, but I don't think so because it's hard. Not only is it hard to do live well as the person creating the live, it's hard mm -hmm. to do live well digitally because who is where and when. So, so there's a lot of issues around this being a dominating force. And I just, I, again, I've never seen a media channel where live took over from any form of pre-recorded media. So right. could it be a first of course? Will it? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's room for it. I like the way you and Jeremiah recorded uh, your, your podcast episode on clubhouse actually the, the topic was clubhouse and it was recorded on clubhouse so meta. Yeah. Um, so meta. because that does open up the opportunity for, you know, this kind of Phil Donahue esque, you know, studio audience, you know, uh, in interaction within the show, which is really cool. We yeah. have it here in the form of, you know, comments, but that would be a very different experience if we were bringing these people in via right. audio or video right. to well, interact look, with us. I mean, Am I going to lie to you and tell you I don't want to rent this beautiful theater and do live six pixels with friends? And hang I would. Yeah. This is that. I mean, the ability to do my show for 30, 40 minutes and then pull in audiences and have people interact was phenomenal. I mean, I should be very clear. You're not allowed to record anything in Clubhouse. In fact, it breaches their terms of service. And the way that you, you circumvent that is you let people know in the title that it will be recorded and things like that. But recording Clubhouse isn't like, oh, you hit the record button or their software. Um, you're not seeing what's behind this camera, but I've got a real professional audio studio here that I have MacGyvered <laughs> to make it be able to record the way it does. And even when I'm uh, on the mic in Clubhouse, everyone's like, what kind of AirPods are those? I'm like, there's not a not airpods not no. what i'm doing here and that's a challenge with, with clubhouse too is the audio can be pretty sketchy i mean it does sound more like t telephone than it than it sounds like digital audio and for me and for the listener i don't think we are able to recognize how important great sounding audio is even in video i mean i always make the argument that video is fine but if the audio is bad it's a real hard thing to sit through so audio is key um, and I, you know, I'm sure clubhouse will release some form of recording functionality, but I'm geared up here. So, so I'm lucky. It sounds really good. Yeah. I mean, you, you do radio all the damn time. So you're, you're hooked up to sound good. And I, I like to think I have the Mitch Joel starter kit over here, <laughs> my little <laughs> blue Yeti later, and Jason. Stuff, you know, uh, <laughs> but yeah, the, the audio quality is, is a big deal. And that's one of the reasons, you know, Eric asked the question earlier, why would you not want to be on clubhouse? And one of my big hangups with clubhouse, although I definitely see the merits of it and I'm going to continue to explore it. One of my big hangups is I have white noise deafness. And so when, oh people talk over top of each other, I can't hear anything. Wow. So clubhouse can be in, in, if it's not a well-moderated room, it can be an incredibly frustrating experience for me personally. doesn't necessarily mean that makes it a bad place. It's just hard for me to keep up if two people are talking at the same time. I can't like, I love live music um, and I love going out to bars and experiencing live music. But if I'm there with friends, 
I won't know a thing they say all night. I won't be able to hear any of it. Yeah. All, all I can hear is the noise. I mean, people um, control the mute button on there. The mute button has become like the hashtag where you flash the mute button to show approval. Um, it's a known thing that you, you know, you, you're on mute the whole time unless you are speaking. Right. It is, you know, also the interesting thing about it is it's a very, it's a much more diverse, I wouldn't say very, it's a much more diverse platform. So you will see more BIPOC, you will see more um, gender diversity. And there is what I love, this this protectionism around not cutting people off, around letting people finish their thought. Great idea, in theory. Yeah. Yeah. We know all too many people <laughs> who, if you don't if you don't cut them off. So again, like to me, the role of the moderator is a bit to say, got it, let's move here, got it, let's go there. And in some instances, it can be seen as what I'll say, not offensive, but off what people want. Right. But I'm okay with that because again, it's it's my room. I mean, you could leave. There's no issue with that. And I'm trying to have it have a pace and energy that isn't just letting people drone on and on because they have the mic. So again, it depends on the room you're in, but uh, the diversity and the control of the mute might help you versus Zoom, where Zoom must be hell for you. Yeah, it can be for sure. Yeah, I I, I am the king of the uh, the Zoom call facial expression, to the point to where my colleagues, like uh, my my create executive creator director Tim Jones, where he typically joins for our conference calls, the internet can be a little spotty sometimes, and when he breaks up, like I'll be sitting there in the meeting and I'll just go, <laughs> and he's like, oh, I'm breaking up, aren't I? Yeah, like yeah, I, yeah, I have these facial expressions that everybody knows that right. okay, if Jason's right. got a look, then something's wrong. So yeah. it's funny. Uh, John Michael Morgan says, "So much brilliance and handsomeness right there." Speaking of brilliant and handsome, John Michael yeah. Morgan says hello today. Good to see him in the stream today on hi, the uh, Twitters. Yeah, hi John. Um, okay, so Facebook and Instagram, or Facebook slash Instagram, has started to really tickle the underbelly of government regulation uh, for lots of reasons, political polarization, the lack of policing of misinformation. Um, and then one that I look at more anxiously is the monopolistic like control of social advertising. Are we g getting to a head with this? Will the government bring Facebook slash Instagram to face the music with regulation soon, do you think? And what does that mean for other social networks? Yeah, it's, it's a really curious thing because I go back to, you know, the late nineties when I got involved in technology. And one of the things I loved most about the blogging and the early days of podcasting was the fact that anybody who has an idea can publish it in text, images, audio, video, live, pre-recorded short form, long form, and a million flowers might blossom. <laughs> and it was an exciting time. And I would argue it still is. I don't believe I had any foresight to see how monopolistic that would become so quickly. Mm -hmm. And to, to quote Professor Scott Galloway, we are in a scenario where we have several unregulated monopolies. And that is really where we're at when we look at Google and Facebook and maybe a, a hint of Twitter on the advertising side. It's going to be very difficult for the government not to demand regulation, while at the same time, my question always remains, what does that look like? Like, what do you do? Does that mean that the YouTube money isn't attached to the Google money, isn't attached to the whatever money that the Facebook money isn't attached to the Instagram money, does that solve anything when even of in and of themselves, they're still unregulated monopolies. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're going somewhere else for Facebook. It's not like you're going somewhere else really for search. It's not like you're going somewhere else for YouTube or Instagram. So I don't know what this looks like, but I have a lot of stress about it because I don't feel like the government has presented a strong enough case for what decentralized or unregulated looks like. And I'd also argue that historically, we really haven't seen it in terms of advertising and media. We live in a world of monopolistic media entities. Now, again, like I live in Canada, so my perspective is really different. Like up here, our mobile carriers, we've got, you know, Bell, Rogers, TELUS, and it looks competitive and they spend a lot of money on advertising, but, you know, the prices are not even close to as cheap as they are in the US. It doesn't feel like it's not 
everybody colluding. If you really look at the plans, I'm not saying they are, I don't know, but it's kind of like gas. You know, it's like there's three gas stations and everyone has the exact same price down to the point of a penny. And you're like, well, I'm not feeling a lot of competition here, am I? Right. So I, I want it to happen. I don't know what it looks like. And I don't know if there's an infrastructure to actually even support it. Should the organizations do it? And should the government try to police it? I just don't know what this looks like. And everybody who's smart who says something like this, and, and including people like Galloway and, and, and Rushkoff and many others, my only question is, what does this look like? We're going to break up Amazon. Okay, so your shareholders are going to own Amazon, Amazon Web Services, and Whole Foods. Don't don't punish them so much. Don't give them three amazing companies now to own instead of one, <laughs> right? And and that's maybe a simplistic way to look at it. But what does that look like? You're just right. you're you're still creating essentially three other monopolies within this, and and so it frustrates me because, man, Jason, you know, you want to speak to marketers like you've got a book coming out. How great is it that you can basically peg 20 to 50 places where you know if you get a hit on the podcast or onto the newsletter, you've covered your discernible market, where you've got a place where if you go into Facebook, Twitter, Google, three places, you can really efficiently with not that much budget target people. Yep. And so I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm saying what are we going to do with that? Because the other impact is you might have a, a massive impact on the small and medium-sized businesses that are now able to afford this advertising that might not be able to if you deregulate it. Yeah. And again, I'm not for de I'm not against deregulation. I think it needs to happen. I just don't know who wins in this besides maybe people in the elected offices who look like heroes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. And and there, so the two things I would add to that is number one. Uh, uh, the government typically has no clue what they're doing when they get into the technology space. Uh. So it's going to take them a while to catch up. Uh, and number two, I think it might be a situation where there are people out there with legitimate concerns about needing regulation, but I think it might be a world that is worse off than we are now with it unregulated in a lot of ways. Yeah. But I also don't want to put my faith in you know, three or four people's hands of how they're going to dictate how we do business. This is the problem. It's all true and it's all real and, yeah. and, and it's right. Like you're right. I don't want, I don't like the fact that there's, that it's completely monopolistic. I don't like the fact that government can't control it, but I can't unsee when they call Mark Zuckerberg to the Hill and somebody starts asking him about how many files he has. I'm like, what <laughs> files what are you even talking about like what does that even mean and even yeah. he's sitting there and like you're sir you're not answering the question i'm like i don't know what to answer here like uh, yeah. it's the most absurd question you could be asked so <laughs> i don't know what a file is <laughs> it's, i find it really frustrating because it's a scenario where the only people that are winning are these monopolistic entities and the shareholders and at the same time i am sitting here being a shareholder yeah so I do benefit from it at this. It's very frustrating to me. And I think that the real impetus has to be by the consumer. And that's my biggest frustration is we talk about how, you know, privacy, we're all up in arms. I don't know. I saw the quarterly reports. It doesn't look like anybody's up in arms. User, you know, we're adding more users. We're, they're spending more time here. There, there has never been any form of re revolt from the real users that has said, we're tired of this. And even the whole brand safety thing, which is more germane to what you're talking about now. I mean, what a load of bunk that was. All of a sudden, we're worried as brands about where my ad appears. It just so happens that we're really the most maddest at the beginning of a global pandemic where we're about to cut advertising budgets and fire a bunch of people. So the way we're going to cover this is saying, oh, you know, we're really mad at Facebook and the safety of our ads this is out of control with BLM and, and, and you know, all this. And the truth is, they should have been worried about this 15 years ago because they never knew where their content was being shown. Yep. And so I get frustrated when it's this, this chess game, this weird chess game, because I'm not like that as a person. Mitch, Joel, where can people find you on the interweb, sir? I think we just find me on the interwebs. Isn't that how it works? We're here. <laughs> um, you can find me always at sixpixels.com or mitchjoel.com or just Google, Google Mitch Joel or just email Jason Falls and go, where's Mitch at? 
<laughs> that's well, I've, I've taken a little bit of a, of, of, of a step out of that process because I've posted the links uh, and your, to your LinkedIn profile, MitchJoel.com and SixPixels.com over in the uh, chat session. Uh, Mitch, thank you so much for your time and your leadership, your vision. You, uh, you, you keep us all pointed in the right direction, and I do appreciate you, sir. I'm very excited about your new book. You are an officer and a gentleman, and I'm honored to always be present with you. So it's good to but, see you, Jason. Thank you very much, Mitch. I appreciate your time, man. Have a great one. You too. All right. Mitch Joel, ladies and gentlemen, how about that? Always good to have a conversation with Mitch. Uh, I don't have nearly enough of them uh, because we don't uh, get to see each other very often, but it's great to be operating in a virtual world where I can, we can have him here on the show. Um, and uh, sneak peek, uh, I think I might actually be uh, making my own appearance on the Six Pixels podcast soon. So that'll be fun. So looking forward to that. Uh, thank you to lots of people in the comments today. Obviously, you know, Mitch is a big attraction. Doesn't surprise me at all. But thank you, Eric and Chip and, and so many other people for uh, chiming in today. Uh, John Michael Morgan stopping by. Good to see you. Um, you know, so many Brandon, great point that you made. I really appreciate everybody stopping by and joining in the conversation today uh, with Mitch. And, uh, you know, Izzy House even says that was awesome. Thanks. So, yes, it was. And it wasn't me. It was just Mitch. But that's that's how that works. OK, so let me give you a quick uh, recap on Amazon Live. I, I promised you last week that I would um, you know, report back on my test on Friday afternoon of last week. Um, I connected with Amazon Live and did uh, basically a an influence marketing strategy session. I uh, did a little 30 minute show where I walked people through one of the features from the book uh, that is a, a benefit, you know, if you buy the book. And, and the reason that I did that that way, because I was doing a live video on Amazon and the whole point, the reason that Amazon created Amazon Live is to give, you know, people who are, you know, either affiliates and are selling, you know, all kinds of different products or authors like myself or, you know, people who are, or you, if your company sells on Amazon, you have the opportunity to go on and do kind of almost like a QVC type thing. If you look at it very simply and say, Hey, we're live today. I'm going to show you this product and you can click down below and purchase it directly. Right. Well, I could go on and say, hey, you know, Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand is now available and you can click down below and order the book. And so that's the simple way to do it. You have an opportunity to get in front of shoppers on Amazon in a live video situation where they can interact and click and purchase right there. Really convenient, really good. But as I pointed out on the, the show, um, I my 30 minute show that I did there, which was an arbitrary number. Uh, I just said, well, I'm going to go about a half an hour and see what happens. I went live and my whole point was, I'm not going to sit here and tell you to buy the book for 30 minutes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through an influence marketing strategy session. So I, I took that whole content marketing, inbound marketing mindset of let's provide value to the audience. And hopefully they will enjoy that value enough that they'll think, hey, this book's probably a pretty good purchase. I'm going to do that. And so I uh, went on. Uh, and um, did my little strategy session. I walked through uh, this this thing. If you're watching on the big show, I'll throw this up there. I went over the Winfluence Priority Scorecard, which is a way for you to rate and rank the influencers uh, that you might uh, uh, encounter and survey as you're doing your influence marketing programs. I walked through that, explained you know uh, how to do it. Uh, in fact, uh, I have a link somewhere of of where that. Uh, video is if you want to go see it. I'll try to throw that up here in a minute, but let me kind of give you the report. <clears throat> so that's what I did. Connecting to Amazon Live was super easy. You can go straight from your phone um, or you can use the, you know, RTMP, custom RTMP things for live streaming. So I could go through Restream or I could go through Switcher Studio, either one. I could just, all I had to do was set it up, drop in that live stream URL, drop in the stream key, which you kind of have to copy and paste. It's a big, long thing. But once you set up the destination on your live streaming software, you can actually, you know, go to your phone where you start the Amazon Live thing and say, I'm going to, you know, come in through the custom RTMP. And as soon as you hit, you know, record or go live on whatever your streaming service is, it goes to Amazon Live. So I was able to control it with the graphics and all that kind of stuff. So that super easy. Didn't really take much setup at all. Um, you do have to select at least one product. I obviously selected Winfluence, reframing influence or marketing to ignite your brand. Uh, put that up there uh, so that people could purchase that during the show. As I thought about it, 
after the fact, what would I do differently? I think what I would do differently is in, in you know, again, being useful to the audience, I would have Winfluence up there, but then I might also have books that I'm reading now. Like I could have thrown up, um, you know, Adam Grant's Think a Grant, uh, Think Again. I am uh, listening to that on audiobook right now. I'm trying to, I'm getting through uh, uh, Mark Schaefer's uh, cumulative, what's it called? Cumulative advantage, something like that. Um, it's it's over there, and I'm I'm going through it. Going to have him on the show to talk about it eventually, but I'm I'm making my way through it as well. So I could have thrown up a bunch of other books or other products, even though that probably wouldn't make as much sense. Other than you know, the Blue Yeti, I'll throw up the Blue Yeti next time. And so now all of a sudden, the people interacting with me have the opportunity to quickly purchase products that I might refer to, that I might recommend, etc. So I really liked the format. From an e-commerce perspective as a business, if you sell products via Amazon, it really is a great way to interact very directly with potential shoppers um, and the audience of people on Amazon that are you know, looking for that live video content um, and talk directly to them about your product or your service. You can do it in a very QVC, here's the product features, product benefits you know, kind of thing. Um, or you can do it in that sort of inbound content marketing kind of process where you say, hey, I'm just here to provide some value for you. Down below are several products that that we sell. And if you'd like to purchase them, we'd be honored to have you as a customer. But the whole point today is we're going to do a strategy session on X or we're going to show you how to do this. So I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was smart. Uh, the big problem that I had was I think I only had seven or eight you know, people watching at one time. And that's just because I haven't built an audience on on Amazon yet. Um, and so I might do, you know, more live streams there. I might, you know, check out the terms of service to see if I could, you know, broadcast even digging deeper there uh, to have another place where digging deeper could be seen uh, and or I probably wouldn't do digging deeper because this is a cornet thing. Um, but I could, you know, throw up something around, you know, influencer marketing and, and, and continually promote the book. And so that might be an interesting way for me to expand my audience there. Providing more consistent content is going to draw more people in. So um, Amazon uh, Live was a good experience for me. I think it's a very uh, powerful, potentially powerful platform. If you can build an audience and provide really interesting content there, I think it could be a conduit uh, to sell more of your items if you sell on Amazon. So worth a shot. Um, and uh, Chip Griffin says, the way you say Blue Yeti almost suggests you have an inappropriate relationship with your microphone. Well, you know, I, I get close to it. Probably closer to it than most things. There you go. Uh, what else do we have today? Uh, oh, I have the link to that first live. If you want to go see my first Amazon live, whoop, uh, just drop the link out there. It's jason.online slash first live. So you can go watch what I did there to see if, you, if you're interested in that. Um, let's see. You look enough like Patrick Rothfuss to lure his readers. I don't know who Patrick, uh, that's Troy Janice chiming in there. I don't know who Patrick Rothfuss is, but if his readers want to follow me because of the way I look, uh, they'd be the first, but I welcome them. <laughs> okay. Quick reminders for you folks. This one, this is ridiculous and it's going to be fun. This is coming up today at 1130 AM Eastern, 830 AM Pacific. I will host the Winfluence Book Launch Live talk show live on my social channels, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and my YouTube, Jason Falls, which is, I think I got 30 followers or subscribers there, so it's very small, but it'll be on YouTube if that's where you like to find things. Um, it will be the most fun you've had in the middle of a Tuesday since the last time you were day drinking on a Tuesday. I think I'm going to stream it to, I might stream it to Amazon Live uh, as well, so that we'll, we'll, we might try that anyway. Uh, David Meerman Scott, who wrote the forward to the book, Eric Deckers, my co-author for my first book, No Bullshit Social Media, Christy Samus from Clever, an influence marketing agency out in the Bay Area, comedian Josh Schneed, Tabitha Hawkins from the Association of Influencers and Content Creators, and many more guests will stop by for a little talk show fun, quick hits of information and goofiness. It's going to be informative, but it's also, I hope, you know, going to be a lot of fun and funny. We're going to give away some signed books sent directly from me, if that's worth anything. So if you don't have your book yet and you would like a signed copy, uh, we will be giving those away on the big program uh, at 1130 today on my social channels. And, and brace yourselves, everyone, uh, as part of the big show, my mom. Uh, my mother will be there, and it will be, uh, I, I'm sure, a hoot. 
you never know with mom if she's going to do one of those sentimental strolls down memory lane and tell something warm and fuzzy, or if she's going to completely embarrass the hell out of me. Um, and, and it might be both. Um, but uh, I don't think in a live video situation, you will get to see her at her majestic awesomeness of trying to tell me a story about someone from my hometown that I don't know. Because then she says, you know, Julie, she was your sister's college roommate's cousin's aunt's uncle's next door neighbor's hamster's best friend's cousin's wife. And I'm like, I don't, have, I don't even know what that means. I don't know where you where, where you're going with that. Uh, so you probably won't get to see that, but you'll get to see mom. And that's fun. And as I mentioned earlier, she did once in front of a room full of people give me a box of discarded breathalyzer, home breathalyzer tests. So that should give you a little insight into mom's sense of humor and presence in the world. So it's going to be fun. You should come by for that. Uh, that that's going to be, again, 1130 uh, to 1 today on my social channels. This is not something I would uh, torture the cornet audience with. It's just going to be goofy fun. We're going to have a lot of fun conversations. And it's all to celebrate February 23rd, the official published date, launch date, of this bad boy right here, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. The book is out. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to get a lot of feedback from people. Most of it has been, well, all of it actually to date has been good. I haven't heard anybody complain about it yet. So, but I'm, I'm interested in everyone's feedback. I would love it if you have the book. I'd love it. You, I need Amazon reviews. Those are important. And, and you got to go review the thing on the Amazons. So I need some help there. So go review the book on Amazon if you if you have it or when you read it. And I'm, I'm not going to pander for five star reviews. I want honest reviews. I don't care if you hated it and you put a one star. Just tell me why. So I understand that. That's that's as important as getting five star reviews in my book. There you go. It's going to be a fun day today. I've got to mix in some actual Cornette work, uh, but I, it's going to be a fun day today. Uh, not that Cornet work isn't fun and my clients aren't fun, but uh, it's book launch day. So I wanted to just have the whole day to just goof off, but I didn't want to take time away from my clients who have important things that I have to tend to. Uh, if you are watching or listening to the show after the fact along the C-suite network or via one of the video recordings online, remember we typically broadcast this podcast with a live stream to join us live. Follow me or Cornette on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter, or look for Digging Deeper on YouTube and you'll get that handy live notification when we stream. That's normally at 8 a.m. Eastern, 5 a.m. Pacific on Tuesday mornings. Look me online at Jason Falls. You can typically find Cornette at Team Cornette. One more thing before you go. I've had some internal conversations about our start time. Um, I've had a, obviously a couple of guests from the West Coast in the past that I've pre-recorded, which I don't prefer to do, but I also don't want to torture people and make them get up at five o'clock their time to do the show. Um, but I've also had some people at Cornette say, hey, you know, I would probably, you know, be more apt or able to watch the show uh, and support the show if it weren't at eight o'clock on Tuesday mornings. So I'm curious, you in the audience, um, if we were to shift the show to midday, 1130, 12, 1230, something like that, what would you think about that? Today, obviously, I'm doing this live thing at 1130. I have no earthly idea if that means more or less people are going to show up. Um, it's obviously being marketed and promoted a little differently than we would typically do a Digging Deeper, so it, it won't be apples to oranges comparisons, but we've been thinking about uh, shifting the show. I've always thought pre nine o'clock is good for the East coast anyway, uh, or the central time zone, because it allows you to do this before work. I'm not interrupting your work day. Um, and so, uh, I would love to know your thoughts and your feedback on if we were to move the start time of the show, I'll ask the question for a couple of weeks and get your feedback. We're going to keep talking about it internally at Cornette might be worth a try to move it more later in the day. So our friends out on the West coast can join us. Um, and, you know, maybe we're a good, you know, lunch break for you on a Tuesday as opposed to something uh, before your workday starts. And Chip Griffin says, uh, you're just trying to get rid of me by moving to a more congested time. <laughs> yeah, OK. Uh, I, Chip, I would never do anything intentionally to get rid of you. You know that if I wanted to get rid of you, I would I would block and ban you from my social networks. <laughs> At any rate, what do you think? Should we move the show? Is it going to be uh, disruptive or upsetting to your day to have to stop and listen to me if you would like to? Or will you just ignore it? Or will you watch the recording or whatnot afterwards? I don't know. I'd love to uh, 
I'd love to know. Um, Allison Miller Thompson chimes in. It would be harder for her to join midday. I appreciate that perspective. Um, and I worry about that. I don't want to lose anybody who might join us on a regular basis here, but we also have a bunch of recordings as well. Uh, Troy says 1130 Eastern. Yes, that's for the thing today is 1130 Eastern. Uh, Troy says he likes the early time when I work from home. Doesn't mess with my central time commute. Uh, Izzy says, I like eight, but we'll go to any time you choose. 4.30 to six would be bad. Okay. I'm not going to go to 4.30 to six. That's too late in the day and I'm tired and cranky by that point. So, and Chip Griffin has the comment of the day. He likes to wake up with me. Ew. Um, oh, Tanya jumps in, uh, and says, I normally watch the recording afterwards. Great job, by the way. Well, thank you. Ta it's, it's Tanya. It might be Tanya. I'm sorry, Tanya. You might pronounce it Tanya. I never know. Uh, Tanya Torp, CVA. Thank you for chiming in. I appreciate you watching the show afterwards. If it's more convenient for you to watch live in the middle of the day, I'd like to know that too. So going to take it all in and see what we can do. It's obviously always going to be available to you in recorded format, but I love having you all here live too. All right. Uh, we've, we've taken up far too much of your time this morning, so I think it's probably about time to go. Next week on the show, Andrew Deutsch from Fangled Tech will be here. He and his company help brands convert every touch point into voracious advocates for your brand. We're going to find out how and how we can do the same next week on the program. That'll be live on the interwebs on Tuesday, February 30th. No, there's no February 30th. What's that? Is that March 2nd? I don't have the date written down. I think it's March 1st or 2nd. Next Tuesday, you know when it is. 8 a.m. Eastern, 5 a.m. Pacific. The episode recordings will be archived on the network where you watch or you can listen to the podcast via audio later on that day. And now we've reached the point of the program where Jason doesn't know which buttons to push. And we always screw something up or we often screw something up. I think I got it right this time. Let's see. That'll do it for this edition of Digging Deeper. Make creativity your business advantage. If you like the episode, share it with a friend or colleague who might as well. Digging Deeper is a production of the Cornette Group. Find us online at teamcornette.com. Our executive producer is Christy Heiler. Creative director is Jason Majeski. Uh, the associate producers include John Hurston and Ashley Harris. Thank you. It's composed by Rex Manor. I'm your host, Jason Walls. Until next time, I'll see you.